Hello everyone and welcome to History of the Second World War. On this episode of our Spanish Civil War interview series, I was joined by Dr. Matthew Carey, the author of Unite Proletarian Brothers, Radicalism and Republicanism in the Second Spanish Republic, which was released earlier this year. Our discussion focused on the events in Asturias, a region in Spain, in 1934. During October 1934, there would be a national strike throughout Spain, and in most areas this strike would either quickly burn out or would be broken up by the government. However, in Asturias, the strike would morph into a true revolution, and for two weeks Asturias would be under the control of revolutionary committees. In the end, 1,700 people would be killed in the region, and 260 members of the Spanish military would be included in that number. One of the topics that we touch on near the end of this interview, and which I think is really important, is the role that Asturias would play in Franco's narrative of imminent and very possible revolution during and after the events of the Civil War. And then I bumped my microphone. Okay. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Spanish Civil War interview series. Today, I'm here with Dr. Matthew Carey, the author of Unite Proletarian Brothers, Radicalism and Republicanism in the Second Spanish Republic. Dr. Carey, how's it going today? It's not too bad, to be honest. It could be a lot worse in the circumstances. Um, <laughs> Indeed. Very happy to be here. 2020 has been a year, is, is all I will say. Definitely. Um, okay, so when I think about socialist revolutionary activity, and I think this is probably pretty common among the people listening to this, I think of urban centers, St. Petersburg, Berlin, Vienna, Paris. But Asturias, where this Asturias revolution takes place, is a region full of coal fields and related economic activity, which doesn't seem very urban to me. Uh, so what was this area like in terms of population and density and stuff like that? Well, it's an area, so Asturias is a region which um, has, it's, it's varied, it's very mountainous, it's coastal, there is agriculture, um, and then as you say, there's this um, kind of coal mining area to the south of the capital. Um, and this is an area that, although compared to somewhere like the Ruhr in Germany, is quite ruralised, it is nonetheless quite heavily urbanised within its wider context. So we're talking about several steep-sided kind of winding um, valleys um, in which uh, roughly about 150,000 people live um, and they live in quite different circumstances depending on the particular area so lower down the valleys you have larger denser settlements um, with more industry steel industry um, coal so shafts into the into the coal pits themselves but then as you go further up the valleys you get more agricultural activity um more mountain mines so mines dug into the side of mountains themselves and the population here can be quite widely dispersed so um you have quite a few, uh, sometimes thousands living in a in the kind of the, the capital of a particular district and then lots of people who are um, living in quite small um hamlets and villages that are kind of more dotted around kind of the, the, the hillsides and, um, and further up into the mountains. And in terms of Oviedo itself, so the capital of the region, um, this is seen and traditionally is very much kind of the bourgeois city of services, of banking, um, and around 75,000 people lived in the kind of the municipal district of, um, of Oviedo itself. Um, but in the capital, it's only about half of that population. The rest um, live in um, rural areas, but also kind of um, industrial towns that are kind of near the capital, producing arms, explosives, and things like cement. So I suppose the Asturias as a region, the coal fields themselves are quite distinctive to an extent. Um, they're quite typical, I suppose, of the north of Spain, but quite different to areas of the south. We're talking about area, um, an area that's, the, in terms of, the, of its population, is very different to Madrid and Barcelona and somewhere like Bilbao, of course, with its iron mines, but also quite different to the south of Spain, where you have the agro towns, um, these kind of very large towns full of um, kind of um, agricultural um, workers. Um, it definitely, in that in that sense, is much more rural than than other than other areas of Europe. Excellent. And so this area uh, has a kind of a mix of. Uh, leftist ideological beliefs, much like every other place in Spain at this period. Um, could, could you discuss sort of what the mix was in terms of, uh, of those beliefs in this area and how they kind of uh, coexisted at this time? Yes, yeah, certainly. So that in terms of the left itself, and the, the, it's important to, to note as well that there's also a strong strand of republicanism gen, uh, um, as well, which 
we generally identify more with the centre. But in terms of the left, we have communists, anarchists and socialists. So all three exist in this particular area. And they're organised in 1931 into two unions um, in, in terms of the coal fields, in terms of the, the mine workers themselves. And numerically and institutionally, it's the socialists who are the strongest. They have the largest mining union, um, although it undergoes a, an important crisis in the 1920s during the Primo de Rivera dictatorship. And it's, it's strong institutionally because it has a, a large network of political and cultural um, centres, um, lots of associations, it has its own schools for children, um, lending libraries, cooperatives, and a long, etc. Um, and the socialists, and they, their membership is recovering in 1931, and they, are, and they, take, um, and they take advantage, really, uh, of, the, um, of, the, of the prestige of being involved in um, the kind of the proclamation of the Second Republic, and therefore they attract many um, supporters, many of those who, of course, des deserted them in the 1920s. So then, then we have the anarchists and the communists, and numerically the anarchists are... There are more anarchists than there are communists in the, in the coal fields. And they both traditionally are identified with particular localities. So the anarchists tend to be identified with somewhere like La Felguera, which was a steel town. Um, and it was a particular area of um, anarchist um, strength. And the communists are often um, uh, identified with Turon, which is this, this, this particular valley um, in which that one particular um, mining company, um, in which one particular mining company operated. But actually, I think if you dig a bit deeper, the, these different groups um, exist. These ideologies exist all over the place in smaller pockets. Um, and so I mentioned the fact that there were two unions. So there is the socialist union and then there is the SUM union, as it's called, the kind of single mine workers union. This is led by communists, but the rank and file are anarchists, which is not really a very stable combination the communist <laughs> uh, emphasis on hierarchy um, and, and the anarchist kind of um, free thinking um, and kind of um, direct action um, strategies and this comes to a head in 1931 so there's a strike just after the republic's um, proclaimed and it's it's a it's a real um, kind of battle between the socialist uh, mining union and this kind of anarchist communist mining union it's a bit of a stalemate um, the, the anarchist communist union declares it, but doesn't really win. Um, and actually that union ends up splitting by the end of the year because of the tensions um, inherent within it. And so there's often been an emphasis in the, in, in, from historians about this period, about this place of the emphasis on the rival between these different unions that socialists and anarchists and communists didn't get on, uh, which is a story that we might be very kind of familiar with. Um, but I think, I mean, what I've tried to, to emphasize in, in my work and what I've seen is there's actually quite a lot of workplace cooperation at times. It's not always easy um, and there's a lot of resentment, um, but there are shared practices like assemblies at the pits when there's a strike you know, and then there'll be, there'll be votes. Um, there are debates, um, often quite fractious debates um, between these different groups. Um, and there's all, and the, and, but this collaboration is often um, at the grassroots and the union leaderships, particularly the socialist union leadership, does not like the, the rank and file working with the other group. And the other thing I suppose that's important to, um, to, to, to mention is the workers' alliance, which is um, emblematic of the revolution of 1934. And it's, this, it's an agreement signed in late March 1934. Um, and it's seen as the moment in which the anarchists and the socialists put their differences aside and work together, um, organize the revolution. And, and, you know, this is, and this is pro profoundly important for kind of the rest of um, the history of the left through the civil war itself, this cooperation between the two. My, my view of the Workers' Alliance is more complicated. I don't think it was quite as easy as that. Um, there are a lot of anarchists in the coal fields, for example, who don't actually like this alliance. Um, and it was only narrowly ratified by the anarchist organization in September 1934. Um, and so I think if you look beyond the leadership and the agreement, agreements the leaderships are signing, things are both kind of a much more complicated practice, both more collaboration, but also more friction. You mentioned that there was a socialist, communist, and anarchist presence within these various unions. What was the general relationship between the size of these groups uh, within the larger union structure? 
the trade union density is really high um, okay. in, in this area dur during the, the Second Republic. And when it when it comes to the the figures for the for the for the um, for the mine workers themselves, the vast majority do belong to a union. Um, what is quite interesting, I suppose, in 1933, there is a there is a bit of a shift. So there's been a battle between these different unions to try and capture as many mine workers as possible and to capture members from different um, unions. 1933, there are these kind of grassroots um, co committees, strike committees, in which mine workers would elect, as well as a socialist delegate, an anarchist delegate and a communist delegate, they elect a delegate for the unaffiliated as well. There's a recognition that there are a small, and it is a small minority, who do not belong to um, the, um, the socialist, anarchist or communist um, ranks, and that they should also have a voice in these um, um, committees, which is quite striking, particularly when the socialists are so overwhelmingly powerful um, institutionally. They have the vast majority of the mine workers are signed up to the socialist um, mining union. Interesting. Um, so in the years before the Spanish Civil War, you know, from the founding of the, the Republic in, in 31 and forward is a kind of a turbulent political period for Spain. And I know that in, in 1933, the Spanish elections saw a, a more traditional conservative government elected. Uh, 1933, for most people know, is also kind of a turbulent year in other countries, perhaps in Germany. Um, was there anything about the events that were happening elsewhere in the world that fueled concerns in Spain, especially among, you know, the people we're talking about right now on the Spanish left, um, about how they hope to prevent sort of the repression that they saw in other countries at this time? Yeah, yes and no. I think I think it's it's difficult, and we can look at this at different levels. Um, I think when we look at the kind of the national level and the national, or the socialist movement on a national level, I shouldn't say national socialist movement because in this particular issue it comes even more <laughs> comes even more complicated. But in terms of the socialist movement, um, there is a there is a particular figure, Francisco Largo Caballero, hugely important um, minister of labor at the beginning of the republic, um, and he becomes kind of the leader of both the party and um, the socialist trade union between from between thirty three and thirty four, um, and he's the one who is kind of the brains supposedly behind the nineteen thirty four revolution. And there's a man, and there's a there's a socialist who's a particular influence on hi, on him, um, who is in fact the ambassador to Germany through 1932 and 33. So he sees kind of the, the, the crisis of the, the kind of the end of the Weimar regime. And, um, and he feeds through, through his writings and through his reports um, into the, to the socialist movement, what is going on in Germany. So there is certainly an awareness of what's going on in Germany. Now, if you look at the level of what's happening in, um, in Asturias, what I've tracked is the emergence, really, of the word fascist in the press, in the socialist press, um, in Asturias. That really only happens after, the, after Hitler um, becomes um, chancellor um, in early 1933. So there is kind of, you know, there, there is a, an awareness uh, of, of fascism. Um, there's not really an understanding of what fascism really is, um, particularly how fascism would work in Spain. Um, given its kind of Catholic traditions or a particular Catholic part to the political culture um, and, and, and given um, the way that um, in the majority party on the right was very Catholic, it, it, it wasn't exactly clear how um, fascism would work in Spain. Um, and it, it's not clear really whether fascism is just a way of repressing the left or whether it is a more generative um, um, political project in its own right and I think that, it, that there, there is really a, a lack of understanding of what's going on and it's easy to just dismiss fascism as just, in the Marxist way as it was at the time as, um, as simply kind of the, the, the an, another crisis or the final crisis of um, uh, uh, kind of, uh, of capitalism itself and so through 1933 there's both a, a kind of a lack of understanding but also kind of a, a, a um, 
also a dismissal of it that there doesn't really seem to be fascism in a Spanish context, which is true the, in, in the sense that the, the Spanish fascist party as we know it, the Falange, was only founded at the end of 1933. Um, and so there is... I, I don't really see much of a learning of what um, of, of lessons from Germany, so to speak, um, in 1933 itself. 1934, in the wake of the elections, um, and and with the change in government, there's greater fear. There's a much sharper edge to kind of to the political struggles in 1934. Um, the socialists seem particularly impacted by what happens in Austria. So the, so the crushing of the Austrian socialist movement. Um, and, and I think it's, that it's not lost on them that Dolphus, um, as a Catholic authoritarian leader, is perhaps closer to what they would see um, in Spain. And it also, I think, is not lost on them as well that compared to Hitler, who was installed in power and, and kind of things changed from one day to another, Dolphus, what you see with Dolphus um, in the words of, um, uh, of Tim Kirk, is this salami slicing of, of, of the socialist movement and of kind of and, and the erosion of democracy, and therefore, I think there is this fear of a gradual slide into authoritarianism and potentially fascism in the future. And so, the remedy for all of this that's re- that's talked about and is shouted about in the press is is some kind of working class unity, but I don't really see a kind of a real. Um, strong kind of analysis of what's gone on in Germany and what the problem is um, at this moment in time. And there seems to be kind of this fleeing, there's a phrase in Spanish of kind of fleeing forwards towards this planning of the insurrection, that this seems to be the solution. You know, um, Attack is the best form of defence to an extent. Um, and that, is, I suppose, is where the, um, the revolution of 1934 can be positioned. Okay. And speaking of, of that 1934 revolution, uh, there was a a general strike or a call for a general strike um, in in late 1934, um, and these strikes would occur in many areas of Spain. It seems like, and there would be some violence, um, but it was only in Asturias that it ended up being a, a sustained revolution. How did it only happen in one place? Like, what happened elsewhere to where they sort of backed out or, or whatever happened in those areas? Uh, and was it simply the fact that those others didn't necessarily fail? It's just, it just so happened to only work in Asturias. It's a very interesting question. And I'm not sure really that anyone has really answered this adequately to my mind. And I also include myself in that. Um, <laughs> I, th- I think one of the questions that, I've tr- that I was driving my research and one of the things that I, I tried to answer was the, the energy behind the revolt in Asturias and why thousands of men in particular, a few women, but mainly men, you know, took up arms against the government and try and understand exactly how you get that, 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 switch um and that ability to to, you know to turn on the government um that and i think i yeah i've provided my answer to that in terms of radicalism and radicalization in in my work but that doesn't really answer why um in in asturias the the revolt was relatively successful as in it lasted for two weeks whereas um, everywhere else it didn't last quite as long i think there's something distinctive about Asturias and then there are kind of, and, and these relate to the factors in, in other areas as well. So I think, I think when it comes to Asturias itself and its relative success, I think firstly, there is a relative strength of organization and a force of numbers. Um, and this relates both to, well, so there's a relative strength of numbers and also the weakness of the security services and, and, um, and, the, and the army itself. So you have thousands of men um, who are members of trade unions who've been, some of them in, in, in terms of socialists have been in training, a bit ad hoc, but some kind of training and also the stockpiling of arms um, ahead of, of, of this insurrection. So they are to an extent prepared and they are used to kind of, to being organized in, in the trade union itself. And so you have an, a, an area in which there are thousand, you know, there is this particular trade union density. They are, um, you have for, force of numbers. You have small outposts of the police and the security forces and of the army itself. So they, can, they were overwhelmed relatively quickly. And when it comes to Oviedo itself, the capital, and this is the scene of most of the fighting during the insurrection, um, again, um, this isn't a, a massive outpost for the army, for example. So I think in that respect, um, 
that that is one of the first factors that I think is quite important for why it's relatively successful. Secondly, they're relatively well equipped in that they do have some arms. They run out quite quickly, but they do have arms and they have dynamite. The miners have dynamite and this is it becomes a useful weapon of, of war. Um, geography, I think, is the third factor which is important. We're talking about kind of narrow mining valleys um, that they managed to gain, gain hold of um, very quickly. Um, um, but it also is quite difficult to move from Leon, which is to the south um, and, and the beginning of the Meseta, so the central plains of Spain. Um, and there's a column of, of um, an army column that tries to um, kind of invade um, Asturias um, and quickly becomes bogged down in fighting with the miners because the miners are quite adept at holding this particularly, um, this mountainous country. And it means as well that um, troops have to be sent by sea all the way around the coast. So it takes a while for reinforcement to reinforcements to arrive. So I think those particular factors are important. And so we're in Madrid, for example, where you have a strike that lasts a fair few days, this is, it's much more difficult to gain hold of Madrid as a, a, into, as a, as a, as a kind of, um, as a group of militias. Um, there is not the strength in numbers at the same time in terms of um, the amount of workers, um, the CNT, the, the anarchists don't, uh, don't agree with the strike, they don't sign up to it. There seems to be a lack of leadership in Madrid as well. And there's, there's also much, many more army garrisons, so it's much more difficult to gain military hold of, uh, hold of, the, um, of the capital. When it comes to somewhere like Andalusia in the south, the story um, that's usually told, and I think is, is, is pretty convincing, is that there was an important agricultural strike in, in June um, 1934, so only three, four months earlier. And what this means is um, that, and this was crushed, so the socialist organisations, which had been powerful, um, were both exhausted, disarticulated, um, some people had been arrested, um, it was very difficult to organise uh, and to prepare for some sort of vaguely defined revolutionary movement. The Basque Country, I think it's no coincidence, this is the area where you see kind of the, the, the strongest um, reaction um, along with um, Asturias itself, um, particularly around Bilbao. And these, again, are kind of a very dense industrial area um, that haven't been exhausted by an agricultural strike in the same way that South has. Um, and so here, and there are also arms um, factories dotted around Ibar and, uh, and the like. So there you also, you have arms, you have um, a, a proletariat who is willing to, to use them. And therefore, you know, that is why there is a more sustained revolt there as well. Events in Catalonia, I think, are quite different. So in the midst of the crisis, um, at the beginning of these kind of strikes and insurrections um, on, on the 6th, from the 5th, 5th to the 6th of um, October 1934, um, Luis Compange, the, the president of the, um, of the, um, the Catalan region, um, declares a, 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 a Catalan state within a federal republic. So I think there, there are factors at play in Catalonia which are quite different to the, the rest of, um, to, the, to the socialist uprising in, in kind of the rest of Spain. Compange has taken advantage of this crisis. Um, he is um, a Catalan nationalist um, and there is a long running um, matter in Catalonia around um, a, a particular form of agrarian reform, which has caused a government, crisis, a government crisis over the summer. So th there, is, there is kind of friction and resentment between um, the Catalan nationalists and Madrid. And I think this is what leads to a very short lived, it barely lasts 12 hours, um, this um, Catalan Republic within a, a federal state. Interesting. So you mentioned that in Asturias, this, this kind of continues for a couple of weeks. And so how was the revolution controlled during those two weeks? Were there revolutionary committees? How, how were they organized and, and coordinated? Yeah, so the, there are a number of, of revolutionary committees. Um, there is a, what is called, and it styles itself as the provincial revolutionary committees, and then a series of kind of local level committees itself, themselves. Um, and the provincial level committees seem to be very much, uh, to be in control of the, of, of the insurrection. And, and it's identified with particularly prominent figures um, like Bellamino Tomas, who, um, um, 
is, is, is the man who, um, the socialist, and he's a prominent socialist from the coalfields, who um, negotiates the kind of the surrender of the forces at the end of the insurrection. Um, Gonzalez Peña, Ramon Gonzalez Peña, is seen as the, the generalissimo of the, of the insurrection itself, and he's also a, a member. I, I am not convinced that this committee was in control of what was going on always in the insurrection itself. I think it's an important figurehead. Um, it is, for the first few days, um, positioned in Oviedo, which is the front, basically. This is the streets of the capital where the militias are fighting against um, the government forces. Um, they're certainly issuing, issuing a lot of, um, kind of decrees and trying to find out what is going on in, a lot of the, lo in the, lo of the local level committees, but I'm not convinced that they, are, they have a, a strong control over it. That said, I don't see in the accounts um, and in the documents any real sense of um, a huge amount of lawlessness. I think these committees, the committees do take power quite quickly and they have a clear monopoly on power, um, which I think is quite important important um, for the level of violence in the insurrection itself. So if we go down to the local level committees, these um, compared to say at the end of the First World War when we have the um, kind of council communism, the committees in Asturias here in 1934 are not, for example, um, based at the factory or the mine. They're based very much in the, at the level of the locality. So we have them springing up in villages and towns and the ones in the larger towns have a certain amount of prestige and, um, and exert a certain amount of control over smaller, um, more local committees as well. And these are formed. So although the, the insurrection is um, led by the socialists or sparked by the socialists, um, these committees tend to have a, a real variety of members of um, left wing organizations of socialists, anarchists and, and communists and even dissident communists as well. Um, and it seems that there, there really was a, a commitment or a, a des um, an attempt to recognise that although, for example, in Mieres, the number of dissident communists was really a handful or a couple of handfuls um, at most, um, they deserved a delegate. That although the socialists outnumbered them by many, many, many to one, um, it made sense to actually give everybody a voice um, in, in a, a certain democratic um, manner. So we, have, so we have those local level committees and then we have the provincial level committees as well. And then it's important also to, um, to differentiate between three different periods. So for the first six days, um, there, are, there is the first wave of committees that establish themselves, proclaim, proclaim the revolution. Um, once it becomes clear that the revolutionaries are actually on the back foot and that they don't have support in the rest of Spain, um, there is a wobble, there is a crisis. And um, in fact, the provincial committee decrees kind of um, a, a retreat, um, but the militias keep fighting, um, which may be a question of lack of communication. Um, and some of the local committees um, do um, dissolve themselves, do disappear. Um, and they are, and including the provincial um, committee itself, and they are um, replaced by my, a kind of more radical wave of, of committees of younger socialists and communists. Um, but this only lasts for a day um, before it's replaced by a kind of a more moderate final phase. And this is the one led by Belarmino Tomas. Um, and he is the one who eventually kind of sues for, sues a kind of, organizes a kind of, um, of surrender with the, um, with the army itself. So during, mostly during the first, like the, the first six days, that first committee, what was their goal? Uh, you know, from reading your book, it seems pretty ambiguous, perhaps a bit unrealistic, which you know happens a lot with these revolutionary movements. So, what, what were they hoping to achieve in those first six days when they thought something was possible? I suppose my way of looking at the revolution itself is very much as a contradictory and multifaceted um, um, phenomenon, and so which I think there's often been a tendency amongst historians to try and pin a kind of a, a single word onto what the revolution was and what it wanted to achieve. And, and I, I, I suppose I tried to do that to begin with and then realised in some respects it was quite a futile um, exercise. And I think if, if you look, if you go back to the fact that this is a socialist um, organised um, movement um, and it was, and it, the plans were set for a kind of revolutionary movement that was very hazily defined over the previous months, 
Um, in his memoirs, Lago Caballero, the organizer, um, details some of the, um, the instructions that were given out to the, um, given to lo local socialist organizations, which talk about, you know, seizing bridges and seizing telecommunications and ensuring control locally. But it's not really clear in that what he actually wanted. And I suppose my, my interpretation of what he wanted from a national level was for this movement to be subordinate, I think, to national level political concerns. And so the insurrection or the movement is sparked by the arrival of the Theda, so this large um, Catholic um, right-wing political um, party, um, it's ascent to power and enters government for the first time, which is interpreted as a threat to the Republic. And so I think what Lago Caballero want, wants to see is a show of strength by socialists, a some kind of kind of revolutionary strike that paralyzes the country, and that either leads to some sort of government crisis and the Fed have to leave, um, government's dissolved and you want appointed, uh, or even the end of the legislature itself and, and new elections somehow. I think that what that's what he wants. So I think from, from Madrid, the order is for a strike, and that seems pretty clear. But what happens in Asturias, of course, is not really um, a strike at all, even though it's often called a, a strike in the wider scholarship. So I think on the ground, it's, it's quite ambiguous. I think when you look at the rhetoric of the committees themselves, um, there are clearly some very enthusiastic um, local militants who, who are in charge of writing these, um, these, these proclamations that talk about building a new society, uh, about... Um, they proclaim revolution and they talk about banning money and they do ban money in some areas. So they're really trying to change the kind of the social and economic fabric of, of the coal valleys themselves. At the same time, it's difficult, I think as a historian looking back on it as well, in the sense that it's also an insurrection and um, I'm, I'll, I'll use the word civil war or use the word term civil war, even though it's quite tendentious to use this in the context of the Second Republic, um, in the sense that what the Asturians are also doing, they're fighting government forces in, in, the, in, the, in the capital, Oviedo, and what they're trying to do, therefore, is wage a war effort, and therefore centralising food pr um, distribution, um, giving out food with a voucher system to an extent is revolutionary, but it's also about waging a war effort. So it's not kind of clear through their practice what they're trying to do. Um, either and and it's also in, in and if you if you go to particular examples and there's a fascinating example in Labiana um, high up in the coal fields as well which is really interesting um, and it, it shows how kind of paradoxical um, this particular movement was I suppose like any revolution so they banned money they tried to stop people using money um, but at the same time they organized these, and I, I, when I say they I mean the revolutionary committee they organized a collection for local shopkeepers to ensure they didn't go bust and to ensure that they had to have some money at the end of this so this this is there's a there's a combination of kind of revolutionary ideals about how you put some kind of left-wing utopia into practice or call it into being in, in the present day but at the same time there's an attempt to kind of not destroy the foundations of local um, society so on the one hand you have a couple of miners who are potentially throwing their tools away and saying right that's it you know we, we've now reached the kind of the socialist utopia and at the same time the unions are trying to keep the blast furnaces warm so they don't cool and crack and they're trying to keep the mines from filling with water because they know they will need um to keep the um, economy going so there's lots of different things i think going on um for the for those first few days i think there are genuine desires for revolution amongst some I'm not sure whether the leaders really thought that um, a revolution was possible. There's a scene um, with, with one of the socialists, um, the veteran Asturian socialists, um, in which he is described as um, receiving prisoners that, that the, the militia patrols have made. And made they, they've, they've arrested local um, rightists and they bring them before him in a sort of kind of for, for him to, to enact revolutionary judgment. Um, and he basically frees them all. He's clearly, he's not convinced by this idea of, of you know, of, of, of a new revolutionary society with a new system of, um, of, of justice. But the militias are quite happy with this. They've kind of, they, they have gone through the motions of, of enacting revolutionary justice.
Um, so I think there are elements of revolution in, in there. I'm not sure kind of what, if it had lasted longer, what would have become of it. Um, but certainly, um, certainly it's a paradoxical and a, and a contradictory multifaceted um, movement and moment. Interesting. Uh, so as things were moving towards their conclusion, you mentioned there's a sort of a third wave of committees and they negotiate a surrender, which seems pretty positive considering how some of these things end. Uh, how was that process like and, and were those negotiations sort of honored on the other side of, of the termination of hostilities, I guess? Yeah, it's, it's a strange, it's a very strange thing to have happened, really. And I suppose it, it brings me back to the point of, of this being almost like a mini civil war. Um, but from, and I think we can think about it in two, in two different contradictory ways to an extent that on, on the one hand, a civil war, civil wars are usually incredibly violent and they don't usually end with a, a peaceful sort of truce. Um, and therefore it doesn't make it seem like a civil war. At the same time, this does seem like a war in the sense that you have the government forces um, recognizing almost the legitimate um, authority of the revolutionary um, authorities themselves, which is seems pretty bizarre. But basically, I mean, what happens? What happens is um, the revolutionaries are on the back foot after the first week. They've lost. Um, they've lost Oviedo, um, and a particular. And a particularly important moment is when they gain and they, they, they seize the arms factory in Oviedo, but there aren't the arms that they expected that have already been moved. Um, so it's pretty clear that they're going to struggle from there on in. Um, re army reinforcements arrive, and so they get pushed back. So they're pushed out of the capital and they're pushed towards the coal fields. The advantage that they have is that these are steep-sided, narrow um, um, valleys that they know inside out so they are incredibly defensible and this is um, kind of the, this the the bargaining chip that the revolutionaries have the reason that they want or they wish to sue for some sort of um, surrender or some sort of agreement is um, mainly attributed to the the reports of the violence by the armed forces on the population of, of, of Oviedo itself. So reports filter through of um, the actions of the army in, in, in places like the outskirts of, of Oviedo itself, where there is widespread looting, um, sexual violence, and the killing of um, civilians themselves. So this, this basically, um, this violence um, almost to an extent forces the hand of the revolutionaries to say, okay, you, you, you know, if we can reach some sort of agreement, maybe um, this won't happen in the coal fields themselves. And so one of the, one of the stipulations is that the, the colonial troops that form part of this column, that they won't enter as part of the vanguard because they're, but they're perceived to be particularly, um, to be particularly violent. So basically the, um, and uh, there is an aspect to this as well in which there is, there, you know, you have a bold revolutionary leader who is willing to cross the lines um, incognito in order to um, um, negotiate with the head of the armed forces. And I think the general um, Lopez Ochoa, who is relatively liberal um, compared with some of his subordinates, at least, and, and the other uh, um, military leaders that he's working with. Um, and compared with General General Franco in Madrid, who's coordinating the operations, I think he. It seems that he admires it, um, the, the kind of the, the, the revolutionary leader for, for in fact doing that, um, and he agrees um, to a a, um, a kind of a kind of a pacted surrender. So what this means is um, the armed forces will enter the coal fields on the nineteenth of October, so two weeks after the movement began. Um, and the revolutionaries will um, leave behind the arms um, that they, um, they have been using. And in fact, what you see in Mieres, which is one of the towns, an important town in the coal fields, uh, and which also seems quite slightly bizarre, is the, um, a transitional authority was appointed. So the, revo the revolution local revolutionary committee, in fact, hands over power to a former local kind of politician, notable, um, prisoners are freed um, and a lot of the revolutionaries kind of melt into the night, I suppose, and, and flee. Um, but there is not, it doesn't descend into an orgy of violence um, when in, in, at that moment in time. So the 19th 
of October, the, um, the army enters the coal fields. Many of the revolutionaries have, have fled. Um, several hundred do end up in exile over the, over the coming weeks and months. Um, but the occupation is much more violent and would be mu well, much more violent than that surrender would, would perhaps indicate. Um, there is the looting and torching of the political and cultural centres of the left. Um, there are episodes of extrajudicial killing, um, although these are, are more limited um, than during the military operations to end it itself. Um, so more, more limited than during um, the taking of Oviedo. But over the coming weeks, there are mass roundups, there are beatings, there is a widespread use of torture in detention, um, most closely associated with someone called Lizardo Dorval, um, nicknamed the Jackal. And the, and the obsession with the, with the armed forces um, in, in these arrests, um, in these beatings and torture is, where are the arms? So where, where have the revolutionaries left all of the arms? Uh, and where is the money? Um, because the during the assault on Oviedo um, and just before the retreat, um, the revolutionaries have broken into the, the in, broken into a bank, broken into a vault, and taken uh, a large sum of money. So it was where, where is this money? Um, and thousands ended up in jail um, uh, um, after this. And so. Uh, and then in addition to that, locally, there were also blanket dismissals from jobs. So all of the mine workers were sacked, all of the steel workers. Um, there was an introduction of ID cards to allow workers um, um, to actually regain their job. There was a purge of teachers and the local administration. So it, it is both violent, but also completely kind of restructures the local labor mar market and, and also... Um, questions of, of sociability as well, cultural centers are completely um, shut down or turn into science of torture as well. Okay, so what happens with the, the mines? Like, you know, the, the, the workers who work there were part of the unions and, and now they don't. Uh, did they bring in other people or? I think there, there is a certain I'm, I'm not actually aware of, of, of inward migration to an extent. Um, what you have, I think, are, are, are a number of workers who are able to at least navigate this context um, and regain their jobs. Um, there is a case of a, um, a civil guardsman, so one of the policemen, um, who basically was as as the mine workers were filing um up to the to the mine to basically ask for their jobs back he would he would basically sit there and he would vet all of them individually and he was basically looking for those who had attacked the civil guard post when he were and, and the, the the attack that he basically survived so i think there were as, as long as you weren't one of the leaders then it was probably possible to slip through the cracks itself and the fact that you do see some attempts at strikes were quite difficult to organize in a, uh, in a situation in which trade unions and left-wing political parties are banned and there's no press either locally. Um, really in 1935, can, and they can't talk about strikes. There's no left-wing press that can talk about strikes. Um, it's therefore, uh, there, there is an organization, but it's, it's underground, not very well articulated, but there are some strikes itself. So I think, I think that indicates that, yes, mine workers could continue to work, if, even though they've been members of the trade union. It's just it was um, very difficult to do so if you were one of the leaders itself. Okay. And of course, one of the things is that actually it takes a long time for production to be ramped up. So it's not as if it takes a long time for miners to, miners to actually reopen. And the same with the steelworks, even months after the insurrection, you don't see the same amount of production. So um, the same amount of mine workers was not needed. Okay. Uh, so after the revolution was over, uh, obviously, you know, by that point, you're talking about 1935, uh, during the occupation, we're very close to another large event in Spanish history. So were there any uh, sort of lessons that were learned during this event that, that would alter the course of, of what people would do at the beginning of the Spanish Civil War? Uh, was there like a legacy there of these, this revolution in Asturias that was considered um, during future events? 
the the relationship between uh, of, of the insurrection to the civil war is a very interesting question and i i think and it's one that scholars really don't like to talk about a lot and i think this is because if you if we fast forward if we fast forward to the end of the spanish civil war basically um and and the the the, the victorious or not quite yet victorious francoists um introduce a law called the law of Re- political responsibilities which backdates in many ways, the beginning of the Spanish Civil War. Um, Retrospectively, support for the left, um, as well as um, um, fighting in the Asturian October or any kind of event from October 1934 to July 1936 is folded into the Civil War. And therefore, this this period becomes one of kind of revolutionary activity that justified the war um, itself from a Francoist point of view. So it's very difficult at times, for, so historians have been very reticent to draw kind of any parallels between 1934 and, and 1936. At the same time, it's, I think often the place of Asturias in the context of the Republic as a whole is underplayed, that we have this two week insurrection, 1500 die. Um, it is massively important as a turning point in some respects for, uh, for the Republic as a whole. And it's clearly it's, sub, it's it's crucial to pol- the political events over the subsequent what, over the subsequent uh, months. So the importance of amnesty, so an amnesty for the prisoners, for these thousands who've been thrown into jail, for participating in um, the Asturian October. Um, and so this is hugely. I think this this is the most powerful motor behind the the victory of the Popular Front in February 1936, um, and. But also for the right, the revolution gives or, or, or provides a um, kind of material proof of the threat of revolution itself. Um, and the memory of Red Asturias, um, the, 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 the threat of Bolshevism on, on Spanish soil can be kind of, it, it can be invoked in, in, over the course of, of the uh, Um, election campaign and this idea of the army as central to law and order and as guardian of the patria i think i think is it pretty it predates 1934 but i think it really becomes cemented um by the insurrection itself so i think in the 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 insurrection is important to kind of political polarization on a kind of on a national level um and to and to providing the kind of the the energy behind the election campaign in in 1936 and and also in to an extent in explaining kind of the, the results the, the support for, for each side um but i think it also provides a lot of kind of the language the political language and the political coordinates of that time as well and also prefigures some of, of francoism in 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 that respect um in terms of what francoist identity um would be ironically i think so, uh, well, so, uh, one of one of the interesting things about the the Asturian October is that despite it being um, a left wing insurrection, what it does it is it is the end of left wing insurrectionism in Spain to an extent. Um, the anarchists distance, distance themselves from using um, um, insurrectionary methods in spring 1936. Um, the socialists have shelved it um, as well, despite their kind of their radical rhetoric. And I think in in Asturias itself in 1936. Um, the, the Asturian October is critical to how left-wing militants see themselves and see one another. And, and ironically, this leads to a certain amount of crisis and fragmentation locally um, because a lot of people have not, do not live up to the revolutionary myth, understandably. Um, a lot of people have been broken by the repression um, or did not stand on the barricade at the right moment in time in 1934, and these people are denounced or boycotted, um, or have to have to prove their worth again in 1936. So locally, it's quite a, a, a fractious, um, fractious time. So certainly, th- there is an important legacy of of the um, of the insurrection itself, um, and 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 it terms of, of providing, I suppose, the, the experience of kind of re- revolutionary collaboration, um, um, revolutionary cooperation am- amongst the left, which will be seen during the civil war um, itself. 